Welcome back. I hope you're having a good day. In the last mini lecture, uh, I introduced the concept of due process, uh, this notion that when the government prosecutes uh, a criminal defendant, they have to give them uh, a set of procedures, that is to say a process that is due, that is fair, that is civil. The debate is uh, what is a set of fair procedures? And the major point of the last mini lecture was that reasonable people can disagree on exactly what a constitutional provision means. So uh, I told you that Earl Warren is associated with this concept of due process, that it is during the Warren court years, during the 1960s, that we see the Supreme Court uh, uh, give a lot of protections to criminal defendants. And once again, remember that Earl Warren's rationale was that the government has all uh, of the advantages. And therefore, if there is to be true justice uh, in America, we need to hold the police uh, and prosecutors to the highest standards of conduct. And so uh, I didn't quite get through the Fourth Amendment last time, but remember the Fourth Amendment is protection from unreasonable searches and seizures. The most important of the cases that I mentioned last time was MAP versus Ohio. And in the MAP case, you have a situation where the Warren Court uh, uh, incorporates the Fourth Amendment. Uh, remember, incorporation simply means that that constitutional provision now not only pertains to the national government, but to states and even to local authorities. That meant that the exclusionary rule uh, now pertained to state and local cases. So any evidence that's illegally obtained is inadmissible in court. And of course, the big question is, what is illegally obtained evidence? For Warren, uh, if there was virtually any technical problem, uh, a wrong form, a misspelling, uh, a simple procedural error, that was inadmissible. And certainly in MAP versus Ohio, uh, the MAP conviction was thrown out. Uh, but as the court has grown more conservative, the Berger Court in the Leon case gave good faith exceptions. Uh, and the Rehnquist Court, which was an even more conservative court, uh, allowed the police uh, to open a, a closed container uh, without a warrant, which Warren would have never done. Now, in this lecture, I want to begin with the, the fourth, and this was supposed to be at the end of the last lecture, but I didn't budget my time very well. Uh, we have a, a case in which everyone agrees. This last case is a nine to zero decision. That means the conservatives, the moderates, the liberals, they all agree. Uh, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, nine to zero is the most common margin, which means that the law is very clear to everyone. Politics doesn't matter. And in this case, we have a juvenile, JL, who is a 15-year-old. Uh, the police in Miami, uh, Florida, are told there's a young black man uh, near a pawn shop. I forgot the name of the pawn shop. We'll call it Randall's Pawn Shop. He's got a gun in his pocket. Go get him. The police in Miami show up six minutes later see a young man that fits that description. They tell the young man to put his arms up on the bus stop or the bus shelter. His arms go up and it reveals a gun and he's arrested and convicting on gun wielding charges. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court unanimously ruled that the police cannot stop and frisk a suspect based only on an anonymous tip. Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote the opinion in this case uh, and said uh, that if we were to allow the police to stop and frisk suspects based only on an anonymous tip, it would open up American society to widespread and persistent police badgering. The Fourth Amendment is not that easily satisfied. So in this case, all of the justices agreed that there are limits to police powers. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, all of the justices agreed that allowing the police 
this type of power based only on anonymous tips would violate the spirit uh, of the Fourth Amendment, and, and I think rightfully so. Uh, I remember when this case occurred, I was uh, a fairly new teacher uh, at Merced College. I had been here since 1998. Uh, I, I got it half right. Uh, I, I did predict that the Supreme Court would not allow this search, uh, but I remember that my prediction, my wag, right, my wild ass guess, uh, I, I thought this would be a six to three decision. Uh, I thought the three most conservative justices might allow this search, but none of them did. Uh, it was it was nine to zero. So in the arena of the Fourth Amendment in searches and seizures, there has been more movement uh, over time in this particular arena than any of the other amendments involving criminal defendant rights. Uh, we have a court, the Warren Court, uh, that uh, uh, holds the police to incredibly high standards of conduct. Over time, the police have been given more power, more discretion to investigate criminal behavior. But as the JL case uh, illustrates, there are limits uh, to even the most conservative of justices, and in this case, the police lost. I want to turn uh, to the Fifth Amendment protection from self incrimination. And as I pointed out in the last uh, presentation, uh, this is a difficult area uh, because where are the boundary lines between a voluntary and a coerced confession? Now, the two most famous cases in this area, and your textbook does a good job going into a lot of detail, uh, so I will do a kind of a superficial job uh, in this area. Uh, the first case is Escobedo versus Illinois. Uh, when Daniel Escobedo uh, was arrested, he told the police that he wanted his attorney present uh, during questioning and that he wanted to remain silent uh, until his attorney was present. In fact, Mr. Escobedo's attorney uh, ends up showing up at the police department. Uh, he says that he wants to see his client, and the police did not allow that. Uh, after several hours of interrogation, I, I forgot the exact number, I think it was something like 14 and a half hours, he ended up confessing uh, to the murder of his brother-in-law who had uh, killed his sister. The Warren Court overturned the conviction of Escobedo, declaring that uh, uh, in this case, both his Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights had been violated by the government, uh, that he had specifically asked to exercise his constitutional rights, uh, and they had been denied repeatedly uh, by the police. Uh, even when this case occurred, uh, most police departments uh, were okay with this decision. They said, look, okay, this, this man uh, said that he wanted to exercise his constitutional rights. The police denied that. Uh, that was an error on their part, and they could understand that conviction being overturned. Uh, the second case, and this is the one that I want you to star, uh, this is the one that's significant for test purposes, uh, is the 1966 case of Miranda versus Arizona. Uh, unlike the Escobedo case, when Ernesto Miranda was arrested about a kidnap and rape in Arizona, uh, he did not say uh, that he wanted to remain silent. Uh, he did not say that he wanted his attorney present. Uh, but the police did not inform him of his criminal uh, suspect rights either. And so the Warren Court used this case to ask a very straightforward and fundamental question. And that question is, when a criminal suspect is arrested, who has the burden? Does a criminal suspect have to articulate or demand their rights, which Escobedo had done. Remember, Escobedo repeatedly asked to speak to his attorney. He repeatedly said that he wanted to remain silent until his attorney was present when he would answer all of those questions. Or instead, is the burden on the police? Do the police have the burden of informing 
a criminal suspect of their rights before questioning commences. And of course, in this particular case, Warren overturned the conviction of Ernesto Miranda, said that in this particular case, the burden is on the government, the burden is on the arresting officer to inform a criminal suspect of their constitutional rights before questioning commences. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, we get uh, uh, the, the, the famous Miranda rule or Miranda card or Miranda rights or being Mirandized. I've heard this expressed numerous different right, ways. Uh, this series uh, uh, of rights that are laid out in this Miranda rule, which was actually written uh, in Placerville of all places uh, in Central California. If you're going towards Lake Tahoe on Highway 50, you'll go through Placerville. The whole, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you uh, in a court of law, etc. Now in the Miranda case, uh, Miranda was retried. Uh, in this particular case, uh, his ex-girlfriend, if I remember the story correctly, turned state's evidence against him, and he served what I consider a very, very short term in prison for a kidnap and rape. He uh, went to prison for five years uh, and then uh, was released. Uh, I actually had a... Uh, former student of mine at American River College who uh, was an emergency room nurse in Phoenix when uh, Miranda later was uh, stabbed and uh, showed up in that hospital. I remember she went into graphic detail uh, about that story. And, you know, I'm always telling you guys that we're a lot closer to history and historical figures than you might think. So uh, here was a woman in my political science class in the early 1990s, who was an emergency room nurse in a hospital where Ernesto Miranda uh, unfortunately died in this case. Uh, I want to just quickly conclude uh, this mini lecture with the Sixth Amendment, the right to counsel. Uh, I talked about how federalism right permits diversity and that usually that's a good thing, but I told you that it's not always a good thing. So, for example, one way in which states were different before 1963 was that the Supreme Court uh, allowed the states to decide for themselves if they wanted to provide legal counsel for the poor. Uh, many states before 1963 did provide legal counsel for the poor. California would be a great example of that. Uh, but most southern states didn't, like Florida. Uh, I talked about the case of Gideon versus Wainwright many times. Uh, Clarence Earl Gideon, uh, remember, did, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've seen accounts to where uh, he only completed uh, the third or fourth grade. Uh, I actually saw one report that said that he uh, graduated from the eighth grade. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how educated Mr. Gideon was, but not very. Uh, he had to try to defend himself in court against a professional prosecutor. Remember, the charge was that uh, Clarence Earl Gideon was accused of breaking into a pool hall, stealing quarters out of the various machines and stealing a gallon of wine. Mr. Gideon was unable to defend himself. He was found guilty. He was sent to prison. And the U.S. Supreme Court overturned that conviction unanimously saying that lawyers are not luxuries, that lawyers are an essential part of the judicial process and judicial system, and that all states must provide legal counsel for the indigent or for the poor at taxpayer expense. So Mr. Gideon was given a retrial in Florida Superior Court, uh, this time with a public defender, the public defender was able to expose a very weak case of the prosecution. And in the retrial, a jury found Mr. Gideon not guilty. And so what had convicted Mr. Gideon was not his guilt. What had convicted Mr. Gideon in the first case was his ignorance, his inability to defend himself again in court against a professional prosecutor. 
In the next lecture, we move to the death penalty in the 1800s.